So uh, what I'm going to focus on, a lot of the material, it's what we didn't coordinate this. It's just that Jeff Carlson, I, it's, it's remarkable how much our talks are going to overlap, but yet there's enough distinction that I think you'll see, you know, our themes are consistent, but we're giving you slightly different information. If you need uh, this, this PowerPoint, well, you don't need it. If you want this PowerPoint afterwards, I'll uh, just obviously ask me and we'll figure out a way for you to get this because, again, I know people in the back might not be able to see this. So wh what I'm going to go through here is the dot-com bubble, the housing bubble, and then future cra crash question mark because what I want to show you is even though the stuff that we're telling you, obviously there's a sampling bias here that sort of people in this room you guys are kind of weird. Is that a fair thing to say, right? So you, your coworkers look at you a little bit oddly, perhaps. You maybe keep, keep your opinions to yourself when you're out and about town. Um, so I realize that you know, we all think the same on these issues, and that's why you're here, and you're, you're kind of probably hearing things that are consistent. But what I want to show you is this way of looking at the world, the, the stuff that Jeff and Carlos have talked about and that I'm going to be going over, this really did explain what happened for the last crash and that you know, Austrians really were not shocked to see that, whereas a lot of mainstream people were. Um, if you take nothing else away from this talk, if you haven't ever seen it, go to YouTube uh, and I mean, wait till I'm done talking, but do it afterwards. Go to YouTube and look up Ben Bernanke was wrong, okay? And then make sure you get a good one. There's like compilations of it. You know, get one that's got 50,000 plus views to make sure it's a good juicy one. And you'll just see that Bernanke, back from 2006, before he was even Fed chair, when he was just like on the Council of Economic Advisors, it, every step of the way was wrong about what was coming. Like back then, he was on like CNBC, and they're like, no, uh, uh, Ben, they're, they're saying that there's, there's maybe a housing bubble. What do you think? And he was like, well, there might be some froth, froth in the subprime sector, but we don't think, or, you know, it ended up being a lot of froth, didn't it? And, and then every step of the way, then the next, his next thing, I think he was in front of Congress and they were saying, you know, do you think there's going to be a recession? And he, and this was like in early 2007 and he goes, oh, no, 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 no. It's there, there might be, you know, the housing sector's in trouble, but we don't think it'll spill over into the broader real economy. Then the next time the clip shows him saying, oh yeah, there's definitely going to be a recession, but we don't think it'll be too bad. And it was just all along the way that he, that he was wrong. Okay. And again, remember he got reappointed too. Right, so it's just showing you that you know, Washington, D.C. is not a meritocracy, and so it's not merely that we're contrarians here. And also, it's, it's not just that we're always you know, d doom and gloomers, that I, I will tell you when I get to, uh, there's one slide in here out of my whole PowerPoint that's actually optimistic, just to give you a sense of the ratios, okay? There's a lot of pessimistic slides, just to warn you, okay? But what I want to show you is that the Austrian approach explained that to kind of give you confidence that you know, this, this stuff we're relying on here, this really did come to fruition last time around. Okay, so first let me just, again, go through the theory pretty quickly and then give you some of the facts. So what causes the business cycle? The uh, speakers today, we all subscribe to the theory that was developed by Ludwig von Mises. Uh, first in his book, The Theory of Money and Credit, and then throughout his career he elaborated upon it. And then, uh, you know, one of his leading followers, Friedrich Hayek, who actually won the Nobel Prize in 74, largely for his work developing what we could call the Mises Hayek theory of the business cycle. So the, a quick introduction, I'm sure a lot of people in this room, you know, some of you are experts in this, but some of you may have never heard someone just stop and, and spell it out. So let me just give you the big picture of this. The, the way to understand the Austrian theory is sustainable versus unsustainable growth. And so if there's genuine savings, then that fuels sustainable growth, right? That's, it's not an aberration for living standards to rise over time. That's normal in a market economy because as Jeff was stressing in his remarks, people live below their means, right? They have an income, they save some of it, that accumulates capital equipment. So part of the way to understand that is yes, there's technological discoveries. We know how to do more stuff now than people 100 years ago did, but also our workers have more tools and equipment to work with, right? So that's partly why our standard of living is higher is because previous generations were saving and accumulating capital all along. So there's nothing weird about a rising stock market over a long-term period. If that's, you know, that, that could be a barometer of the genuine health of an economy, and there's no reason if output keeps rising, it doesn't need to collapse suddenly. And one of the things that helps coordinate that are interest rates. So interest rates, as Jeff was stressing in his talk, are market prices, and they coordinate what consumers are doing and what firms are doing. And the crucial thing about an interest rate is it has to do with time, 
Okay, now for our remarks today, obviously I gotta be brief on this, I'm just sort of giving you the intuition, but the idea, like if you're a business person, you know that the interest rate, like if you have a long-term project and you're trying to decide, should I pull the trigger on this project or not, you know, it involves a lot of upfront costs, and then you have projections about the revenue it might bring in down the road. To say, is this a good idea or not, what do you need to know? You need to know what's the discount rate that I'm using on this cash flow projection. You need to turn future dollars into present dollars to put them on an apples to apples basis to see over the next 10 years, is this thing profitable or not? You need to know what's the relationship between future dollars and present dollars. That's what interest rates give you, okay? So that's a crucial uh, price in the market to help coordinate things over time so it's consistent. So the economy doesn't grow too fast and then sputter out or you know, it, 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 the amount people wanna save and defer to the future, how do entrepreneurs know that? How do they know they should invest in long-term projects because people are willing to wait for it? Well, that's what interest rates do. That's the job they do in a market economy, if they're the correct price. So what happens now if the commercial banks, in modern times aided and abetted by central banks, if they flood the loan market with unbacked credit at artificially low rates, that screws everything up, right? It's the wrong price now. So it's like the interest rate, if it's artificially low, is giving a signal to entrepreneurs saying, go ahead and invest in long-term projects because people have saved more, but what if people really didn't save more? What if the reason interest rates are down is not because everybody is being real frugal, but instead because the Fed decided to buy a bunch of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities and it created money electronically out of thin air to do it? Well, then you can see how there's gonna be a disjoint in the economy. Entrepreneurs are gonna be investing, starting long-term projects because the interest rate signal's giving them a green light, but yet people haven't saved more. On the contrary, if it's a boom, people are saving less. And interest rates are down, so they don't wanna save on that account, and they feel rich, because it's a, it's a boom period. So you can see how the different pockets or segments of the economy are doing incompatible things. It, it would make sense, it's fine to invest in longer term projects if, if people are willing to defer consumption for a few years until those new goods come out of the pipeline. That's all consistent you know, over time, that, that meshes. Those plans are compatible. What doesn't work is if everybody, like in terms of wage earners and so on, if they wanna consume more, they wanna big, buy big fancy houses, they wanna go out to the movies more and so on, buy a sports car, while the entrepreneurs are thinking, oh, we can invest in longer term projects because there's more capital available. Those two things can't be true at the same time, and yet that's what happens during an unsustainable boom period. Okay, and so again, the, the cheap bank credit and low interest rates, they cause an unsustainable boom, which inevitably leads to a crash. So I think Jeff stressed this in his remarks, in the Austrian framework, it's sort of flipped from the conventional narrative. In the Austrian framework, the boom, when everybody feels great and the unemployment rate's real low, everyone's getting, you know, you can quit your job, go get a better job somewhere else, things are good, business earnings are high, the Austrians look at that and they're worried and they say, this is, this is artificial, okay? Whereas that's the thing that most mainstream economists, when they give policy advice, they're trying to go back to that. The Austrians are saying that's where the seeds were sown for the crisis that's coming. And so then when the crisis hits, the Austrians are like, well, yeah, what do you think was gonna happen? This needs to happen, this cleansing period, it's painful, but we gotta rearrange resources and get them back on a sustainable trajectory. So the recession period is actually healthy in a perverse sense from the Austrian framework and policymakers, to use that euphemism, they should just keep their hands off and let it do what it needs to do. Okay, so this general framework I've given you, let me just point out that economists who are relying on this sort of thing that I'm talking about, they predicted the housing crash years in advance. There's lots of quotes, there's some great stuff like that Ron Paul was doing from the congressional floor in the early 2000s, but let me just give you one quotation so I'll read it first, and then I'll tell you who it was. So he says, higher interest rates should trigger a reversal in the housing market and expose the fallacies of the new paradigm. This exposure will hurt homeowners and the larger problem could hit the American taxpayer who could be forced to bail out the banks and government sponsored mortgage guarantors. Okay, so that is clearly what did happen in fact going into the, the housing crisis. That was economist Mark Thornton, you know, on staff down in Auburn, Alabama. He, was at the, he works for the Mises Institute and he said that back in June of 2004. Okay, so it's eerie when you see how accurately he nailed that. And again, it's you know, Thornton relying on standard Austrian business cycle theory 
to, uh, to make these sorts of uh, commentary about the, at that time, everybody was real excited about the great housing boom. Okay, so now let's, let me just show you some, some data. And again, for people way in the back, you're not gonna be able to fully make this out. But uh, I just wanna show this isn't just words up here and the fact that, you know, oh, we don't like the Federal Reserve. Or, I mean, to be clear, we don't like the Federal Reserve, but it's not merely our distaste. I wanna show you that the numbers actually fit this stuff. Like you can go and, and point to charts and, and, and tell this story and, and talk about turning points and what have you. So this is the federal funds rate. This is the one that, you know, Carlson and Jeff were both talking about. So I'll tell you the timeline. So down here, this is 1998, 1999, 2000. And then this is the recession. Remember there was the uh, terrorist attacks and then the dot-com crash. So this was the recession in the early 2000s. George W. Bush was in office. And you can see the federal funds rate was at 6.5%. And then they brought it all the way down to 1% by June of 2003, held it there for a year. And then in June 2004, they started hiking every time the Fed met, they would you know, raise, raise it 25 or 50 basis points. Okay, so the same playbook that they're doing now, it was just not as severe back then. That, oh, the dot-com crash, terrorist attacks, the economy's on the ropes, what do you do? Keynesian textbook move, you cut interest rates. That's how you stimulate from the monetary side. And they were calling Greenspan, he was the chair at the time, remember, they were calling him the maestro. They were very happy at how he engineered a, a takeoff in housing prices, even amidst what should have been on paper at least a bad recession. So people don't call him maestro too much anymore. Okay, so now taking a, a further step back here, a broader picture you can see. So this blue line is still the, what was happening with interest rates. This red line I put on top is the Case-Shiller Home Price Index. And so you can see, that when the, you know, they cut interest rates and then started ra raising them. And so you see this red line really zooms up in the mid 2000s. That's when the housing bubble really was accelerating. And then it turned and started crashing after they had fully raised interest rates back up to their new plateau. Okay, so again, the, you know, the, the timeline fits that general narrative I was giving you that the Fed, the dot com crash, the Fed eased by cutting rates, that started blowing up the housing bubble. You know, prices started rising, like consumer prices, the stuff that like the Fed kind of gets worried about, like, all right, we can't keep interest rates down at 1%. That would be crazy. So they started raising, and then once they were full, you know, finished with that normalization cycle, that's when home prices turned around and then started crashing hard. And then, of course, what did they do? Well, they started cutting again, because that's what you do. When the economy's bad, you cut interest rates. When the economy's healthy, you start raising rates. That's the standard Keynesian move. Okay, so as you well know, Bernanke did the same thing uh, qualitatively, but quantitatively, he did much worse. Okay, so here is a long-term view of interest rates. Again, we didn't plan this. This is, we all decided to use the same boring charts with you guys. But this is the federal funds rate. You can see this is 1960 up to the present. So I did this long view, and I think that's probably why Jeff was showing it also, just to show you this is not, we're not like just cherry picking and looking at the last 15 years or something. Over the long term, you can see how ridiculously low interest rates have been. This is not normal. And so over this whole post-war era, you can see interest rates, how high they were. And then this right here is what Greenspan did that we're gonna say had something to do with the housing bubble. And now you can see what Bernanke did. So what I wanna point out is 1% is higher than zero, but also look at the, the length of time that it was down at 1% for Greenspan for literally just 12 months. Whereas with Bernanke, and then going into Yellen when they started raising, that period of 0% effectively interest rates, that was for seven full years. Okay, so it, not, it wasn't just that the interest rates were lower, but they kept them at that low level for seven years. So the point being, if, I, if you bought the story a little bit, and you think, yeah, what Greenspan did after the dot-com crash probably had something to do with at least how big the housing bubble got to be, then you can see why this should be alarming. The, Problem with this though is this understates how much more Bernanke did because once interest rates get down to zero, it's hard to push them lower than that because people would just go to currency. So a better thing is to look at the stuff that like Jeff was showing you with the, you know, the big monetary base. So here I've got the blue line. So the title of this slide is stock market tied to the Fed from 2009 to 2016. Because a lot of people were like, oh, you naysayers, you're complaining about stuff. Well, you know, once the economy bottomed out and we got our recovery, then look, look at how the stock market's booming, and I'm glad I didn't listen to people like you. Okay, and, th and that's, that's fine if you're timing it right, but I just want to show people, so if you chart from 2009 to January of 2017, so I didn't like 
have to fiddle with this. This is just what the St. Louis Fed's website generated by me picking these two series. The blue line is the Fed's, uh, or sorry, the blue line is the S&P 500, and the red line is the St. Louis monetary base. So that's the, the thing Jeff was showing you. So you can see uh, this was QE1, then they stopped, then QE2, they stopped, then QE3. Okay, so the red line showing how the Fed in spurts kept buying assets, then would back off, then buy assets back off, and so on. And you can see how tightly the stock market index moved you know, with that thing if you pick the appropriate scaling on the vertical axes. Okay, and so you, it's, and if you remember, for those of you who are really in the financial markets, this, this relationship, like that's partly why when the Fed decided to launch another round of QE and they would point to, you know, softness in the economy, one of the things they looked at was the stock market. Okay, so it's partly, you know, the, the, in other words, the red line starting to move up was partly because they were seeing stock prices were faltering. And so they thought, oh, the economy needs more stimulus. Let's start buying some more bonds. All right, so you can see how tightly those were together. So just in general, think of all the bad things economically the Obama administration was doing. And, you know, and this isn't political. This is just, you know, standard economic stuff. If you think markets generally work, you know, they were running trillion dollar deficits, I think four years in a row. They uh, massive takeover of the healthcare and health insurance sectors, talking about, you know, raising the minimum wage several times. Some of that was signed, you know, by George W. Bush. But, you know, that, that did happen in these years. Threatening people with a, a big intervention into the energy sector, you know, with a cap and trade and carbon. It didn't go through, but, you know, threatening to having all kinds of regulations on emissions and so forth. So there were a lot of things they were doing that you would expect to have hurt the economy to see the stock market booming like that and then to see how it goes hand in glove with the Fed just creating money and buying government debt and mortgage-backed securities should make you think that that stock market correlation there is not because investors realize how great the future was. Now, let me mention, I, I didn't continue it because after Trump's election, the stock market did rise uh, some. And, and so this thing would, you know, if you, if you kept this going, then the stock market would seem to have gone above because the, the Fed was not buying bonds after Trump got elected, okay? And so when I say the, the Trump card here, I will um, say that the stock market rise since his election, I have no problem saying that's due to like fundamental legitimate factors. Again, not being political, but just in terms of the stuff he was saying he was gonna do. Like after the initial scare, and people were like, oh yeah, he, maybe you know, he's gonna do all these things that he said he was gonna do, like deregulate and so on tax cuts, what have you, it would make sense for, you know, given what stocks were on the eve of the election and they thought there was going to be a Hillary Clinton administration, then he comes in. Once people got over the shock of that, it makes sense to me that stock prices would go up, that they would revise their forecast of profitability and so on. So that, that's fine. But I'm saying clearly, even before the election, in my mind, the, the stock market had been pushed way up by uh, what the Fed had been doing. Okay, so this is maybe a way of seeing it. We're now tightening after a prolonged period of easy money. So again, I, I, I believe me, I understand, especially Carlson and I have been going around, for those of you in Nashville, you've, you've heard this story, and you might say, well, you guys were complaining about this five years ago. Well, when they're doing an awful policy for seven years, it shows our consistency, right? We were talking about it all along. So if you think about it, the, the Austrian story is they pump money in, cheap money, pushes down interest rates, and that gives a false boom, and then they start hiking, and then they pull credit out, and that's when the crash happens. Okay, so they really have just recently started tightening, and so you know if there's a big crash that happens as they continue to tighten, that just that would be standard. You know, looking back, that's standard Austrian theory. It's the reason it seems like wow, we're just perma bears is because they had this crazy policy in place for so long, but they are tightening at this point. So now that I've uh, complained so much about monetary policy, let me just say a few words here uh, about fiscal policy. So it is true that the, um, the tax cut, clearly it was not designed the way, you know, in other words, if they had told me, this is how much revenue you're allowed to spend or forfeit in terms of a static analysis and go ahead and do something that you think is economically good, but also we can sell to the public, I would not have done the particular package they did. I mean, Carl's has some great research. He did an Alara Murphy report on this. Like, it really was like Paul Krugman's caricature of Republicans giving handouts to the wealthy and so on with a surprisingly little, you know, crumbs thrown to the working class. But still, the government taking less of people's money, that's, I'm always on board with that. So I, given that it happened, I'm glad it did. 
Uh, but it is true that you know once you, you build in all the assumptions, the standard scorekeeping, it is amazing how much the federal debt's going to explode according to even conservative estimates. So even if people aren't factoring in that there's going to be a crash, right? If they assume the economy is just going to gradually keep growing and things are going to go back to normal, the, the numbers, so there's no way that people in the back are going to see this, but the Congressional Budget Office came out with a recent thing. They're saying starting in fiscal year 2020, so the federal budget's fiscal year starts in, on October 1st, that you're going to have a trillion dollar deficits forever. Okay, for the next, you know, as far as the eye can see, the deficit just structurally in there, you know, the way it's built in with the, the mismatch of revenues to spending, that the deficit's gonna be a trillion dollars plus. And that's, there's, no, that, there's no reason for that to fix itself with current policy. Okay, so this isn't like, you know, under the Obama years, they could say, well, we're in the midst of what was gonna be the worst crisis since the Great Depression. No kidding, we had trillion dollar deficits, but then it sank down once the economy, you know, recovered. They don't have that excuse here. This is a normal economy they're forecasting, and yet they're saying, yeah, we're on the numbers here. It's, we're going to have trillion-dollar deficits perpetually. And the federal debt held by the public, so my figure is lower than the ones, what Jeff and Carl's were showing you was the total outstanding stuff, counting like the Social Security Trust Fund. You net all that stuff out. Just what the outside world is holding in treasuries, that's projected to hit $29 trillion by the year 2028. Okay, which is only a decade away at this point. All right, so again, you could just see the, the corner they've painted themselves into. Even people who don't understand Austrian business cycle theory, just look at these numbers, are wondering, what's the exit strategy here? Because as, as Jeff was stressing, they're kind of in between a rock and a hard place. As, as regular prices start rising, you know, the, the unemployment rate now is very low by the official measures. So they can't continue to have these artificially low interest rates because, oh, the economy's so weak. Like, they've run out of that excuse. They kind of have to start letting interest rates rise, but yet with this much debt that they've added and are going to continue adding, that the interest rates are going to be huge. So it's sort of like the debt they ran up during the Obama years didn't feel as painful because at the same time, the Fed pushed interest rates down to zero. Okay, so it's, you know, like if you're getting credit card offers and you can keep rolling over your balances at 0% APR for, you know, six month, 12 month promotional periods, you can go run up the credit card bill and it doesn't feel painful. You get a lot of good stuff and it doesn't feel painful, but then once those introductory offers run out and you start getting you know, regular interest rates hitting you, then all of a sudden the full amount of your profligacy comes home and you realize just how much you overspent. So I think that's the, the situation we're in. And so you, know, you, you can see that they can try to keep interest rates low, but that's just going to make the reckoning that much worse you know, as the economy overheats the way Keynesian would talk about. And yet, once they start letting interest rates rise, you're, you're going to have that uh, not only a crash from the Austrian point of view, but even putting that aside, just the interest rates on this debt are going to be uh, just, it's just not going to work. They're going to have to either just cut a bunch of everything else just to pay interest, or like Jeff says, come up with some way to give people a haircut and they'll probably come up with euphemisms and way to do it so it's not construed as an explicit default because after all the US Treasury you know is the safest investment on planet Earth they're not gonna want to give that up but they're they're running out of options and uh, I know it, it's it's real easy like I've refrained from making cracks about Donald Trump just because it's, it's so lazy at this point like that's what every person does on Twitter but it certainly does not seem like he's laying awake at night worrying about the CBO report about the debt in 2028. I'll just put it that way. That does not seem to be something that's keeping him up at night and that he's come up with long-term strategies. It seems like people are thinking one week ahead with the policies they're putting into place. And we've gotten to the point where, you know, these things, it used to be, I remember when, you know, I'm not that old, but I remember when I was younger, people would talk about the entitlement crisis and, and everything was always 30, 40 years in the future when bad stuff was going to kick in unless we turn it around now. At this point, it's like, no, starting two years from now, the, debt's gonna, the deficit is gonna be a trillion dollars plus going forward unless we start making changes. So that's, that's the window now that we're dealing with uh, and, and none of the changes is, is gonna be good. So I hope you enjoy your lunch. Thanks everybody. <laughs>